excited to stand before all of you. Our own small group family has grown so every day is increasing day by day. And uh, I'm really very happy to stand before you and add or support what the previous speaker spoke about the small group. Like I'm going to take you into a different dimension to add more points or additional information about Simagro. It's a different, it's a new dimension for a sustainable agriculture. And uh, <coughs> Professor Reddy had given all the all the points, all the beneficial effects of the microbes that could be exploited more than what we did. He had uh, presented in his uh, uh, speech and uh, he made it very easy for me to make you understand again about this <coughs> like <laughs> now we are here it's not a new subject the world food yes we are in need of food the demand for increasing food the quantity and quality of the food is a continuous problem. It's not today's problem. And the growing human population is not today's problem. Because long time story, long time story says like how the we suffered for want of food. Like this is not yesterday's problem. We had a great famine, potato. It was affected by a late blight of potato and it caused a famine in Ireland and the great Bengal famine in India, which is caused by another serious disease, Helminthosporias on paddy. So, even today, we have this famine, want of food problem. So, what we did before, and uh, to take you back, that was first green revolution. The green revolution was nothing but to increase the yield. It was the, the scientists they introduced the hybrid varieties of all the crops to give to increase the yield. In fact, uh, uh, Norman Norman Bola he got his uh, Nobel Prize for Peace in 1970 for introducing a magic millet. That's the wheat, a wheat variety, which increased. So in fact, this green revolution transformed India from a begging ball to a breakfast table. But one thing I want you to understand is that all these hybrid varieties are heavy loads of uh, chemical fertilizers and pesticides. They increase the yield. At the same time, they also increase the, the input of chemical fertilizers and uh, pesticides. So in two decades of time, what has happened? Again, the soil is suffering due to this uh, excess uh, no, fertilizers and the pesticides. The, there came another uh, revolution. This is a recombinant DNA technology. This is a gene revolution. Today, you have transgenic plants, transgenic animals, transgenic insects, transgenic fish, transgenic everywhere. Transgenic everywhere is really very good for knowledge. They are also very good in certain science subjects. But as far as agriculture is concerned, to all these products that have been uh, mentioned here, the transgenic plants of soybean, corn, canola, rice, and cotton seed oil, they are all no more in the market because they are deteriorating. And we do not know what is happening because of uh, the interaction of this alien gene into this plants. So, we are fed up with genetic engineering because there are many reports. Science are repeatedly, the scientists are reporting that the roundup resistant soybeans, they do not nodulate and they do not show much increase in yield. And at the same time, the farmers who are using this roundup soybeans are using more of herbicides. So, as a result, what? We have been adding heavy fertilizers, <coughs> heavy pesticides, and heavy dose of herbicides, and we are killing the health of the 
Mother Earth, the soil. So what has happened? The soil, it lots of organic matter, lots of soil microorganisms, lots of topsoil, water pollution, depletion of soil minerals, brings reduced nutrition, increased vulnerability to pest attack. Not only that, the entire environment is polluted. We do not want any more chemicals to be added into the soil by a repeated application because this happens in India. When you ask him to apply 50 pounds of nitrogen, he will, he will, he will think, why not add 70 pounds of nitrogen to get more yield. So it's a, it's a story of the golden duck. Like every time you can have one golden egg, but if you want more golden eggs at the same time, you are killing the bird and you are losing everything. This is what is happening as far as your application, your conventional practice of agriculture, growing different crops, whatever it is, but you are adding more of chemicals, more of pesticides, and more of herbicides, and you are spoiling the health of the mother earth. The soil health is spoiled. Once the soil health is spoiled, and then to recover it back to its normalcy, it takes really some time. So, where we are, we would like to transform to a peaceful life. So what you are seeing is a green peace. Where is green peace? When we talk about peace, it is eternal. You don't see it. They are, you know, they are the microscopic living organisms. You cannot see that. He is father of our nation. He brought peace. Like that. Through peace we got the independence. Now, it is through peace we are, we have constructed, we wanted a green peace here. So you see here the phylogenetic tree of life. What is it? This is the invisible microorganisms. The entire tree is the invisible microorganism. Like what Professor Reddy explained to you that how we exploited the functionalities of these microbes, they are pathogenic microbes, they are beneficial microbes, which could be effectively used. So we concentrated more on them because we have ample evidences of the functionalities of these microbes. What they do into the soil, what they do to the root, what they do to the plant, what they do in water, what they are doing in the environment. So we took this one as our best Thing for constructing the smart world. Now, let me see you that. Let me show you the the way we have constructed this one. This is just a scheme you will see. See the smart world. Amazing results, which I will explain in my subsequent uh, uh, so PowerPoints. So the roots and the plant are very important. Now, what do the beneficial microorganisms in smart world do? They associate with the root. The root exudates. The plant communicates with the microorganisms through the roots. They secrete some root exudates, which the microorganisms utilize. In turn, what do they do? They produce phytohormones, and uh, then uh, you see the different functionalities, the chemical recognition and communication between the microbes and the plants through the roots, you see several beneficial effects like the biocontrol, bioprotection, and the PGPR, nitrogen fixation, phosphate solubilization, potassium and mineral cyclers, and then the phytostimulation, which is something very important. I will, uh, I will speak about it in uh, my subsequent presentation. So all these things put together you have a plant growth promotion and that results in what? That results in yield and the quality food and the quantity. It increases both quality and quantity of food and then you get million dollars. Right. This profit. How do you get this profit? So let us just go into a greater detail. This is what is about small growth. Now, it's the first slide where you have to see. I'm just showing the connection. Is the horse plant, and you see the roots here. You don't
don't see the underground factory. We see the above ground factory. Yes, above ground factory. I'll again uh, explain the next slide. And the underground factory is rich of the microbes that are associated with the roots. So we, this cycle is something very important where we are talking about the nutrient cycling and then the endophytic communication, nitrogen fixation, organic matter turnover. Because when we speak about the nitrogen fixation, as what uh, Professor Reddy said, the nitrogen fixation, symbiotic nitrogen fixation, that's a free living nitrogen fixers. They are endophytic microorganisms which associate with the root surface on the plane and it sometimes enters even through the cortical cell and it uh, hibernates there and it does all the beneficial effects to the crop. So, when you see the next one, oh, I'm sorry. This is something very interesting. See, <laughs> every plant we speak, every crop, irrespective of, it's a, it's a pulse crop, it's a rice crop, it's corn and whatever it is, cereals or pulses or grass varieties, they have this system. That is the shoot, shoot system and the root system. This is the above ground, this is the underground. The shoot system directly depends on the underground system, the roots. Because each plant, any plant, it requires at least 16 essential elements. Some are major macro elements, some are micro elements, some are trace elements. Pinch of it, very small amount. Even if the small amount is not present there, the plant will show you a deficiency symptom. The reduction, there will be a yield reduction. So, we care more about the availability of these essential elements. For the availability of the essential elements, the root needs the soil source. Soil is another factor. So they have to do, they have to have a proper interaction, the root and soil interaction for the uptake of uh, the uh, various nutrients which are mobilized by the interaction of the microorganisms. There are very important one is this portion shoot is something very important which captures the radiant energy and converts into chemical energy, the carbohydrate, which is the source of energy for all of us. This is the prime source of food energy for all of us. Otherwise, we are not able to absorb the sunlight and then convert it as energy. It's only through the plant. So it is, this is the energy cycle where the leaves, so when the leaves have to be plenty to harvest the radiant energy, convert it into chemical energy. The leaf, what is the magic, magic about the leaves? Leaves have got the chlorophyll, the green pigment. The green pigment, the chlorophyll content is something very important for the harvest of the radiant energy. And this chlorophyll content, the chemical constituent, the chemical structure of the chlorophyll, that needs nitrogen. That needs manganese. That needs some trace elements. So that is being supplied by the roots. So there is a proper communication between the shoot and the root and a proper interaction between the root and the microorganisms. <coughs> and as a whole, there is a proper communication between fluent, root, and then the micro. Like what he said about uh, Professor uh, Reddy indicated, the functional microbial group <coughs> in Sumagro are these, the nitrogen fixers, the symbiotic, free living and endophytic. And uh, the direct or indirect, we talk so much about the systemic resistance to the plant. Any pathogen, I mean, normally when we say a pathogen, it, it infects a plant, it enters. But when a non-pathogen infects, it doesn't enter. So most of the microbes that we have in Sumagro, they are non-pathogenic. If it is a pathogenic, they enter through the leaf and it causes disease. We don't have any disease causing uh, uh, organisms in Sumagro. They are not pathogens. When they just infect, when I said endophytic, when it just touches the surface of the root and tries to penetrate, the plant has got a defensive mechanism. It, it, it immediately shows a hypersensitive reaction for the non pathogen. That is where we say about the induction of host resistance, which results in systemic resistance against many of the plant pathogens. 
So the solubilization and the, the mobilization is another important factor. And also the biological control is another added uh, important factor about which I will uh, explain to you in greater detail in uh, subsequent PowerPoints. Now, our construction, it started with the, the source. We need a source. How we got these organisms? We collected the nodules like different, because when we say the nitrogen mixers, most of the pulse crops, they produce nodules. So these nitrogen fixes, rhizobia, they are host specific and there are some rhizobia which have broad spectrum of host. So we collect the, we collected the rhizobia nodules from different pulses and we collected their microbes from the rhizosphere. This is what he said. The zone that is adjacent to the root plane is called rhizosphere and we also collected microbes from soil. Thousands of microbes have been screened, isolated and then we narrowed it down based on to the functionalities. Functional characterization of these microbes, we just narrowed it down to 200 and we did all the identification and then we designed the Sumagro in such a way we could get all the benefits of the targets what we have been looking for. So now I'm going to give you, take you to a different uh, directions. Like uh, though we have this five target in my, in our mind, uh, we also thought of the user. So the Sumatra <coughs> such a design is based on to the users. When you see here, the EPS producers, like what he said, exopolysaccharides. I'll show you what is exopolysaccharides. Many of the rhizobia are exopolysaccharide producers. That's why I always tell that under extreme environmental conditions, what these EPS are doing, they are <coughs> adding benefits. And the nodulation index, when we say we collected some rhizobia which wants nodulation, we look for the intensity of nodule production. And when we see pH, this is something very important for the uptake of most of the elements, nutrients for the plant. So we select microbes which could have a broad range of pH which could survive and multiply and do the functions. And then we also take, uh, take uh, care of the soil. When we speak about the soil, what will happen to the water, what will ha what holding capacity, what will happen to the temperature, what will happen to the structure of the soil, what will happen to the soil pores, soil aggregates. All these things are taken into account when you select out the microorganisms because I will just show you, when you add the microbes, the first and foremost thing what you are absorbing is the increase in organic matter. The increase in organic matter increases the cation exchange capacity. So most of the ionic, the nutrients that are available to the plants are in the ionic form. So we take into consideration all these ones. Then dealing with microbes, this is, uh, it's not just with the bacteria and fungi, as what he says, uh, among the fungi also. We just take into care of the earthworms and other uh, macroscopic organisms which are in association, which are also beneficial for the soil. Then we also take how they work, that is the communication with signal molecules. That's what uh, Professor Reddy said. We selected the microbes in such a way they can communicate with each other. They are complementary to each other. So we select it in such a way that those microbes which can communicate. Then the high value breaks, the rich nutrient content and growth the specialist. Dr. Williams will add more points on this breaks, which is very important for all of you. You might think that it's not very important after all. What is breaks? Breaks is the one which decides everything. When the breaks is high, then uh, the plant, where, when does the breaks go high? When there is a good photosynthesis, when there is a uh, enhanced photosynthesis, when you have a very good leaf system and then more of chlorophyll, then you have more of photosynthesis, then more of carbon hydrates, more of energy is produced. And uh, so this results in a various plant growth promotions and also the, uh, the other enhanced uh, productivity. And uh, well, that again I will touch upon that. And then ability to function under stress conditions, which is very important. And
the water logging conditions and the drought conditions and the sodic soil. Then the saprophytic competency in the new soil, because you all of you know that any native soil, they do have microbes. We don't say that the, the, our soil does not have microbes. They do have, but they do not have that particular concentration which will show a function. Like that is corn sensing. We need that particular concentration. They are in uh, they are in lesser population, so their effect is not uh, visible. Then uh, another point of view is the shelf life, long shelf life under heterogeneous weather conditions. These were all taken into account uh, along with the the main targets we looked for. So again, we were thinking what it should do and uh, behave and look like. Is it eco friendly or user friendly and uh, like is it toxic or non toxic? And when you see here, it is user friendly and we are uh, using humic acid 12% pH 7 as a carrier for these microbes. And uh, these are uh, smagro, okay, this will be available in liquid and dry powder formulations. Smagro is eco friendly and it should be easily applied and for a broad spectrum of crops as what he was mentioning in his talk and then it should be easy for storage and then it should be, we should, you should have easy consultancy and guide which we are doing it and uh, well about the color, it's really grayish black is a pleasant color and uh, easily washable, <laughs> so it's available in different size can be containers depending on the volume. That is our smart. So once again, those who have not followed the professor's uh, slides, maybe you can read it again. So it's a stable, efficacious and eco-friendly polymicrobial formulation. Diverse groups of microbes with complementary functions and enhances the growth, yield, disease resistance of a broad spectrum of crop and then it reduces the input of chemical fertilizer which is very important you have to uh, imprint this one and it reduces or eliminates the need for chemical pesticides. Here we are, I told you that uh, how that uh, the uh, different uh, elements, the, the, the uh, nutrients are important for a plant. This is just uh, to show you the uh, combination of the shoot system and the root system and the association of the microbes in their uptake of nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Because I don't have to repeat once again what's the importance of the nitrogen, what's the importance of phosphate and potassium. So let me skip on. Well, this one shows, uh, this is what I was claiming. The healthy plants, it starts with a healthy soil. So a healthy plant, when you apply Simagro, the first and foremost you will see is increase in organic matter. That is the science behind fertility. When I say increase in organic matter, see many of these organisms, they uh, not only really fix the atmospheric nitrogen, but they also disintegrate. They also work on the organic, existing organic uh, residues, like plant residues, and they, they degrade it and then they add more of organic matter to the soil. When more of organic matter is added to the soil, then the cation exchange capacity is increased. And uh, this is uh, the, uh, the, uh, the evidence that an active microbial population at about 3,000 pounds of humus per acre so, which causes soil aggregation. Soil aggregation is good, it's a, it's a fertile land, it's, it indicates the fertility of the soil and also the water holding capacity of the soil. So, this is something uh, to show you how intimate is a root that is associated with the soil and how it absorbs the capillary water around each soil particles. So when you go into further detail here, when it absorbs the capillary water around each soil particles, this is where your cation exchange capacity works, how it absorbs the various nutrients from the soil. So the root is something very important when we talk about the, the rate of uptake of nutrition from the soil. So this is once again to show you how important are the roots. They are actually, it's a, it's a second green illusion and today the genetists, they are working on 
genes which are responsible for intensifying or proliferation for increasing the root biomass. But here, we are here. We are confirming to you again and again that Simagro is going to increase the root biomass. And you see that the capacity of the plants to absorb both water and mineral nutrients from the soil it is related to the plant's ability to develop an extensive and well-located root system. This is what everywhere we are insisting. Any crop, irrespective of it, whether it is a pulse crop, or whether it is a cereal crop, and in the cereals, that is cereals belong to graminaceous, whether it is a grain crop or a grass crop, when you apply small growth, go to the field and pull it out. Go to the paddy field and try to pull out. You pull out a plant that was uh, receiving smagro and pull out a plant that is not receiving. You cannot pull this one easily because it has got a rich root mass, root biomass, which keeps the plant steady and uh, resistant to large. Well, I'm repeating this because this is something interesting and uh, Knowingly or unknowingly, both uh, my mind and uh, Dr. Uh, Reddy's mind worked very well. I picked up this uh, slide uh, and at the same time I picked up this too. If you see here, as what he explained, yes, the plant growth in uh, the inoculated rhizosphere, this is a control. You see the difference. It increases the plant growth and increases the root biomass. Yes. What is the <coughs> communication between this plant and the root? The plant needs nutrients for photosynthesis. Then it does photosynthesis. Then the photosynthase, they are exuded through the root. And so the roots, they, they, they start enlarging. Where are these microbes? The microbes are associated with the roots. So there is an interaction of the microbes with the root system. And uh, the, the, as what we have, we have been insisting, it is the rhizosphere population which is something very important for the performance of the plant, irrespective of it, whatever it is, whether it's a pulse crop or if it's, a, it's a cereal crop. This is the schema. This is the theory and this is the science. The organisms, they interact, whether it is a fungus or a bacteria or an actinomyces, they are so closely associated with the root and they communicate. Well, all of them communicate because the plant, when it requires, the, you know, the plant has got different stages, vegetative stage and then flowering and then the reproductive stage. Not that a plant requires a nutrient, same nutrient, all different stages. It varies. So this variation is signaled through the roots, through the root exudates, to the microbes. So the microbes function accordingly and then supply the nutrients to the plants at different stages of growth. This is the success story of Sumango. We took, we concentrated more onto this rhizosphere system how these organisms function, interact, and then uh, be beneficial to, to the plant for its growth and for its uh, yield. So this, this uh, slide shows you how the microbes can communicate with each other. They have signal induction, signal, mo signal molecules. So they could communicate to each other and uh, as a result of it, that's why I said cell-to-cell -cell communication and they live uh, harmoniously as a community. Well, uh, this once again what we did in Michigan State University about uh, small growth functional characterization using authentic procedures and then how we uh, uh, functionally characterize the entire organisms and then group them and from different groups how we graded them and how finally we pooled them all together to make a designer's solution, formulation. What you see here today as Sonagro is a designer formation. Formulation, it's for the users. So we took care of all, like nitrogen fixation, phosphate solubilization, then the phytohormone production. And you know that phytohormone, especially the cytokinin, is something very important and which is a uh, which causes their root proliferation and also the shoot growth and then the growth of the lateral roots in such a way that the yield is enhanced.
advanced. So all these things have been done in uh, Michigan State University as what uh, Dr. Reddy said, all the acid production, alkaline production, phosphate solubilization, and then uh, phosphate solubilization, this is a fungal solubilization. And also, other than this, we also worked on uh, the nodule formation. So you see here, this is what he mentioned about the leg hemoglobin. When you just cut the LS of the nodule, you see the pink. That means that it is a live active nodule which can fix atmospheric nitrogen. Like this is again a peanut nodules and you, have, you see the cowpea nodules and this is just an indication how if, if the plants are uh, devoid of nodules, you know, mostly the uh, chlorophyll content is reduced and it becomes a yellowish. We take into consideration all these ones. Once we collect all the microbes, when we group about 30 microbes, we are going to put it construction then you have to think about the community relationship among the bacteria, whether they are compatible to each other. If they are not compatible, if they are antagonistic, then we cannot include those microorganisms. So the Sumagro has got the compatible microorganisms. Like as what you said, the pH. pH is another important factor that which we concentrated on to here and to show that uh, the microbes can keep the gradient of pH in such a way that all the nutrients are available to the plant. So, the next one is, this is the last one, the biological control. I'm not saying this is the last slide, but uh, this is the last factor that, uh, about which I have to say, the biological control. Because as all of you know, I told you that in the Green Revolution, when they introduced the hybrid varieties, these hybrid varieties with the high nitrogen fertilizer and high, uh, this one they were producing, uh, you know, lush growth of leaves, of, which attracted more of pests and diseases. When there is attraction of more pests and diseases, you have to spray the pesticides, insecticides and fungicides. Well, if you just think here about the chemistry or the development of the chemical pesticides, that's a big story. They started with the conventional fertilizers, like just the fungicides which are acting on the surface. Then later on, they came down to the systemic fungicides. The systemic fungicides are nothing but when it, it works from a remote uh, place, that is when you apply it into the soil, it's translocated to various parts of the plant, it gives a systemic resistance to the plant. This is a chemical. Systemic <coughs> resistance, that means what? This systemic resistance, it gives a whole plant the resistance, as a result of which there is no pathogen. But the microbes are much cleverer than uh, the human being. They try to adopt, and there are several results about the fungicide resistance <coughs> and the pesticide resistance everywhere. So, though you think that by just spraying uh, some fungicides or pesticides, you can control, but you are again doing injustice to the soil. The, the, even the uh, fungicides or herbicide, pesticides, what you use, it, it uh, drops down. Even a droplet is toxic to your soil and it will kill any of the micro, beneficial microbes. And uh, so another thing here is biological, it is non toxic to humans and animals. The microorganisms, once colonized, once colonized, give protection during the crop period against plant diseases and pathogenic chemicals. It provides systemic resistance to plants, causes disease suppression in soil. Disease suppression is just what he said about the hyperparasitism. They just suppress the disease causing organism coming nearer to the plant. And they are eco friendly and user friendly. So this is something interesting, you see, how they guard the root surface. They just guard the root surface in such a way that the pathogens will not affect the plant. By just forming a shield around the root zone, they give a systemic resistance to the plant. So this is one of the experiments that what we have done in uh, Michigan. So this here you see that I have added some more fertilizers for soybean crop and this has not been applied with uh, the fertilizer and it's just with Sumagro. How can you is a serious disease which uh, affects uh, a broad spectrum of crops 
And we observed that there is no problem in your spot at all in the soybean plant that was treated with the, the Sumatra. So that's a evidence for us that uh, while well, it gives a systemic resistance against uh, several uh, diseases, polio diseases, this is just to show you the combinations of the organisms in Sumatra. Because he also claimed, he was also repeatedly saying that it's multifunctional. Yes. Each and every microbes that we have in Sumatra are multifunctional. That's where you see that rhizobium, though we claim it for nitrogen fixation, there are rhizobium, bacillus species, Cinnamonas, Bacolaria, and different trichoderma species, which causes biological control, which protects your plant. One is by producing some antagonistic material, number two by hyperparasitism, number three by inducing the host <coughs> So this is just to um, give an explanation how the, uh, you know, the connection once again regarding biological control for the proliferation, multiplication of trichoderma, it needs a citrus and which is being supplied by the plant in photosynthesis and it goes through the root exudates and then the beneficial fungi, they utilize it and they multiply and they give a sheet, they give in turn, they protect the plant from the pathogens and diseases. This is something very important. This is a saprophytic competency. Saprophytic competency is you are training your organisms in-house. I'm training, I'm preparing my child. But when I send him to the school, what is happening? So when I introduce the organisms, what we multiply and what we characterize, and when we design it into a formulation, when I introduce into a native soil, there are several organisms which compete. They, we claim they are saprophytically competent, which is very important for the shelf life. And uh, this is again another important thing everyone should uh, keep in mind is we claim again and again the quality control of Sumagro. The quality control depends on the cell concentration. The cell concentration is the viable cell concentration, the viability. So always we claim it's a trillion uh, active cells in Sumatra and because you know these active cells can interact with each other, that's what I showed you, the cell communication. So the ability of the bacteria communicate and coordinate via signaling molecules in such a way that it keeps your uh, soil healthy and uh, it increases the yield of the plant such a way by just uh, accelerating various growth factors. So this is an authentic method what we use uh, for uh, the estimating the colony forming units. Uh, and this is something very important where I would once again insist upon their exopolysaccharides uh, because this is what uh, I was telling you when we are uh, selecting some microbes like um, rhizobium and uh, bacillus, it's the uh, rhizobia most of the rhizobia they are all EPS producers. So when we collect the rhizobia, we see to that that uh, the excess EPS producers are really good because they help. Under adverse conditions, they help in uh, adhering to the soil particles, make the soil aggregate and make the soil fertile, make the soil pores. These soil pores are very important for aeration and also for the water and uh, this makes the water retention. So any, when you apply Sumatra, the nitrogen that's being fixed, the phosphate that's being solubilized and uh, mobilized, these are all not leached out. It is there. It remains there for a long time. It increases the longevity of the availability of the nutrients to the plants. And uh, well, uh, this, why I'm showing is they could uh, resist the extreme environmental conditions, the temperature and the salt resistance and so on. In, uh, because in our, many of our trials, we have seen that in our test, microbiological test, we found that the Sumatra could, uh, the, the microorganisms could resist uh, sal saline concentration up to 6 percent, which is almost equal to the uh, salinity of the ocean. So this is very important, which uh, it's going to, it's not going to be easy in two lessons that you will understand when you listen to uh, Dr. Alan Williams' uh, lecture tomorrow. 
So this is something very important because it is directly correlated to the, the high bricks is directly it is related to the reduced amount of predation, insect attack. You might see some insect attack in your treated plant, but you cannot immediately say that, oh, this is a treated plant, there are, I am seeing the pest. No, you have to do the evaluation. When you go to the field, if you see there is a pest damage, okay, you just mark the field in such a way that uh, collect some five leaves uh, which are uh, infected by, uh, damaged by the pest or diseases, you keep a grade. So you will have, you will uh, plan a beautiful form a grading scale. Use that one as a scale and then evaluate. You will find that those plots which received tsunami will have less insect attack and will have less disease attack, so attack. This again the taste everything. This uh, breaks is again depends directly related to our photosynthesis and the sexual content and the health of the plant and the nutritional content. This is just to make you salivate because we are dealing with lunch time. So the bricks the insects they don't have uh, you know liver to digest sugar. So that's a real uh, science, uh, scientific evidence. They say that uh, this uh, high mix, uh, it just it emits uh, a UV rays. Uh, so that it gives a signal to the pest not to attack. Don't come near me. Like that's the signal. And this is some literature that I have taken and uh, Dr. Williams will add more about uh, the bricks and the, on the increased fruit size, uh, taste and aroma. Well, again, I'm not, I'm, I'm going to skip this slide because he's going to say more about it. This is just to show you, listen, a big plant is a dinner for a pest, but not a, a small little plant. So, humic acid. See, any formulations, when you just introduce that formulation into the soil, the carrier is something very important. A carrier, here, it is a humic acid for a person, and uh, the carrier humic acid, it is cheap and it's available in adequate quantity. And it's locally available everywhere and it's non-toxic to inoculant bacteria because they are not toxic and uh, the bacteria, they multiply and grow faster in humic acid and the pH should be neutral. It's rich in organic content and humic acid ha also has a high water holding capacity and it has a good adhesion to the seeds because we are trying the seed treatment with the uh, small grow liquid preparation wherein we find an excellent coverage of the seed coat. So we did, in BSA, in the Biosoil Enhancers, in our company, when now we are here, many people are going to talk about the small grow and its efficiency in the field and their experience. But in spite of it, our research, our uh, Attempt, uh, we are attempting more and more and we are working on the, some of the field trials. We ourselves conduct some field trials on different crops, on different seasons. So I'm really excited to uh, show you that how the, our field trials, this is first we did the corn where we, uh, um, we just compared the uh, efficacy of the small liquid preparation with that of the dry formulation and with that of the seed coating and then with 100% conventional fertilizer, and then one with 50% conventional fertilizers and the simago. And uh, we have some uh, results here. And uh, if you see here, control simago liquid, simago treated seeds, dry powder, 100% fertilizer, simago plus 50% fertilizer. We get significant results on the yield per plant as far as the corn. And also in corn, very interesting observation, though I am not going through all these ones because it's a preliminary results, we did the statistical analysis for the yield. And uh, you'll see here, this is the data for corn, once again about the stalk breaks and the leaves. I just want to show you the, the photograph. So the very important one that you will all observe is the praise rooms. This corn is a cereal crop. When we say a cereal crop, it belongs to the family graminaceae. So the grass family, 
In the grass normally we just group them as grain farmers, that is grain crops and then the grass. The grain crops are wheat, barley, corn and rice. The grasses are your lawn grass and your golf course grasses, forage grasses, biofuel grasses and so on. But all these ones got a very interesting observation is the nodal roots. All these irrespective of grasses or the uh, grain crops, they have nodal roots. These roots are something very important and if you observe a plant, uh, corn plant, there are lots of numerous base roots are produced and they enter the uh, soil and they further proliferate and uh, results in uh, increased uptake of nutrients in such a way at the flowering stage the plant needs more nutrients. Then it follows by the grain stage. So, this is a very interesting observation you will see not only in corn, also in uh, rice.
fixed value and also plant height and all those ones. So in our uh, observations, the first one observation that we have found with the wheat grass, you see the control, we did not observe any deer visit. But when you see the bricks, the bricks value is low. Whereas in small liquid, only you see deer visit because the bricks value is high. The same thing with mangrove dry powder, again, because of the high bricks, there is a deer visit. Again, this is in uh, the uh, conventional fertilizer, 100%, and then conventional fertilizer, 50% plus mangrove. Again, we observe the same results, like uh, the, the low bricks value, there is no deer uh, visit here, whereas with the high bricks, we observe the deer.